From 1945 to 1991, my country Albania was under the totalitarian regime of Enver Hoxha. It was the most close country in the world, and for the vast majority of population, extreme poverty was an inescapable reality. I used to read about all of this in school and thought, how could they trust this monster? How could they live like that and not react? Now that I am grown up, I understand the odds are high I would have become just like the rest. Someone who works all day for a loaf of cornbread and thinks that life is good. Propaganda is such a powerful set of tools so that it can convince people to live in misery and think they are blessed. It can convince people to smoke poison and think it makes them look cool and relieve says. It can convince people to watch countless hours of cheap debates instead of informing themselves about issues that really matter. One of the pioneers of propaganda was Edward Bernays. Even though most people don't know him, he was one of the most influential people in the 20th century. If you were a powerful individual and you wanted to improve your image or sell more products, you would call Bernays. His campaigns were grand and expensive, but very effective. He died in 1991, leaving an arsenal of weapons of mass manipulation that are still being used today. That's why in this video we're going to analyze the primary elements of public opinion, and how people like Bernays use this hidden mechanism in such a way that when we realize what happened, it's too late. Let's start with the unconscious mind. According to Freud, the unconscious can influence our behavior even if we aren't aware of its influence. Like an iceberg, the most important part is the one you can't see. It contains all sorts of important information such as motives, feelings and conflicts, it also contains primitive instincts such as the need for survival, sexual urges, tribal mentality, fears, that again, we are not aware of. And society teaches us to hide or repress certain feelings and motivations because it might be inappropriate for other people. But it's still there. For example, you have seen politicians who speak rudely in public and they don't lose supporters. Quite the opposite, they gain even more support, because he is expressing what those people truly feel, feelings that they might not even admit to themselves. Bernays used the insights of Freud and Gustave Le Bon to design campaigns that influence people on a deep emotional level. In other words, if you trigger strong emotions, they are more likely to comply with your request whether it benefits them or not, and they will take that message to their heart they will include it as part of their reality. This leads us to... Illusions. Gustave Le Bon was a French sociologist and the author of The Crowd, The Study of the Popular Mind. He offered advice on the usefulness of images and theatrics as tools of persuasion and referred to the unconscious parts of suggestion. He argued that the popular mind wasn't driven by reason but by illogical and primitive forces. What I want to focus on is this quote from the book. The masses have never thirsted after the truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not their taste, preferring to defy error if error seduces them. Crowds have always undergone the influence of illusions. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Whoever attempts to destroy their illusions is always their victim. To better understand how illusions are created, how you feed them, and how it can make you miserable, let me give you an example from my life. I had an anxiety disorder for many years, and it started with irrational thoughts, that are turned into irrational beliefs. Then the brain responds by building defense mechanisms, meaning that I unconsciously act to protect these beliefs. I build a new perception, consequently about myself and the world, and it comes to the point that I live on illusions. The most disturbing thing is that I spend most of my time processing thoughts, and I don't act. It's like I'm in the middle of the ocean on a small boat, and there's no land in sight. I got into that situation because I accepted those thoughts and beliefs without questioning them. Basically, I indoctrinated myself. Eventually, I got tired of living in a constant state of suffering, and I decided to change. 
That's why I went to therapy and session after session, she helped me think rationally, the defense mechanisms rose less and less, my perception changed, the illusion I had built fell, and I started to act. By acting, I saw that I was living my life based on illusion. Now, it's important to point out how I reacted to these attempts. At the beginning of therapy, I was bitter, angry, and many times rude to her. Think about it for a moment. Even though those illusions I was holding on to were harmful, and I desperately wanted to change, still it took a lot of work to break them. The main reason is that living on illusions is easy, it's something we know. Even though we might feel miserable in that zone, we have learned to live with it. A similar thing is with the masses. They create illusions about certain situations or people, and if you feed their illusions, then they will accept you and you can influence them. But if you try to destroy their illusions, even for their benefit, you will face incredible resistance, to say the least. Okay, so far we have a general idea of how people get indoctrinated and how adamant they are to stay in that zone. Now we will get into more specific strategies on manipulating the masses. The Power of Symbols In 1929, George Hill, the president of American Tobacco, was in a meeting with Bernays and he was very upset. He was like, we are losing 50% of the market because women are not smoking outdoors. We need to do something about it. Back then it was acceptable for women to smoke at home, but women smoking in public were seen negatively. And Bernice wasn't sure how could they overcome this social taboo. So he paid a hefty fee to Dr. A. A. Brill, a psychoanalyst and disciple of Freud. Dr. Brill advised, It is perfectly normal for women to want to smoke cigarettes. The emancipation of women has suppressed many of their feminine desires. More women now do the same work as men do. Many women bear no children. Those who do bear have fewer children. Feminine traits are masked. Cigarettes, which are equated with men, become torches of freedom. Torches of freedom. That phrase inspired Bernays. He came up with the idea to send a group of prominent women lighting cigarettes on 5th Avenue on Easter Sunday Parade. He started by gathering a list of 30 social activists and asked his secretary Bertha Hunt to send them a telegram. She posed as a women's rights advocate trying to gather supporters for the Torches of Freedom campaign. On Easter Sunday, 10 young women marched down 5th Avenue and after the signal, they lit the cigarettes. Bernays notified the press beforehand that he had heard a group of activists were prepared to protest by lighting what they called Torches of Freedom. As Pat Jackson, a PR advisor, explains. And so here you have a symbol, women, young women, debutantes, smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this. Everything was carefully scripted. How should they look? How would they behave? Where would they go? But most importantly, Bernays took steps to conceal the fact that he and American Tobacco were behind this campaign. He hid that Torches of Freedom was nothing more than a promotion for Lucky Sykes. Bernays Approach In my opinion, a situation that fully captures Bernays Approach is this. A PR man advised George Hill to change the Lucky Psych package to a neutral color because service showed women do not prefer its green box. They thought it cashed with their favorite clothing. Hill didn't like the strategy because they had spent millions advertising the package. Then Bernice said, If you don't change the color of the package, change the color of fashion to green. Imagine that trying to change an entire nation's taste of color. Which he did, by the way. Bernie's approach was indirect. He created seemingly spontaneous events that generated news and were linked to his clients' products. He didn't slap facts on your face about why buy a particular product. He shaped your environment in a way that taking a particular course of action 
felt like a reasonable thing to do, that you were acting all on your own. In January 1991, President George H. W. Bush announced the start of Operation Desert Storm, a war against Iraq because he invaded and annexed Kuwait. Three months earlier, a 15-year-old nurse named Naira gave this emotional testimony before Congress. I volunteer, volunteered at the al Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The media heavily shared her testimony. Even the president himself told the story. It shocked the US public to the core and convinced them to take military action against Iraq. The coalition of countries led by the US defeated Iraq within a month. One year after Desert Storm, it was found that the story of Naira was fabricated. In fact, she was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the US, and the mastermind behind this campaign was the world's largest PR firm, Helen Knowlton, who got paid $11 million by the Kuwaiti government. Bernays, still working at the time, was not involved in this campaign, but he must have recognized it for what it was because they were using his strategy. First, exploit their emotions, in this case fear, anger and disgust. Second, build the narrative. Iraqi soldiers embody evil and Kuwait, a young democratic country, needs our help. Third, use a 15-year-old nurse to symbolize Kuwait's struggle. And the most crucial step is to present the message as a news event. As Bernays explained in his book, the Public Relations Council must lift the startling facts from his sole subject and present them as news. He must isolate ideas and develop them into events so that they can be more readily understood and so they can claim attention as news. What makes this step very effective is that most people think that the goal of media is to inform the public. You might already know that it is not. Televisions and other mediums are businesses. Their main goal is to make lots of money. They cannot make that kind of money by informing and educating people, but by entertaining them. This is a newspaper, right? It's 90% bullshit, but it's entertaining. Walter Lippmann was a highly influential journalist. He wrote several books, but the most important one was Public Opinion. The main argument is that since people live with daily problems and minimal access to facts, their sense of reality is shaped by what he termed pseudo-environments. The world is big, complex, and is changing fast. So we build models of our environment in our mind because it's simpler for us to understand it and act. In other words, you and I watch the same event, but our perception of it might be different, because we attach emotions to the event. In addition, we will act based on that perception. Bernays agreed with Lippmann and stated that if you understand people's patterns of perception, you can engineer their pseudo environment. But how can you do it exactly? Let's start with the fundamentals and build up from there. Human perception is a collection of senses, past experiences, stereotypes, symbols, rationalizations, and fantasies. Now let's see how we can influence each element. Information we get from the senses. It's about figuring out what type of content your target audience is consuming and where, so you can craft a powerful message. Feelings we have about past experiences. You might use a shocking event that happened in the past to make a point today. You can also use positive emotions, for example, Coca-Cola connects their product with the feeling of nostalgia. Stereotypes According to Lippmann, stereotypes are a distorted picture or image in a person's mind, not based on personal experience, but derived culturally. We accept them as mental shortcuts in order to minimize effort of thought and defend our position in society. 
The pattern of stereotypes largely determines what group of facts we shall see and in what light we shall see them. Symbols You take an idea and connect it to a symbol, something that makes sense to most people. Rationalizations People decide on emotion and justify with logic. Fantasies What are people's wildest dreams and how can you craft a story that promises to turn their fantasies into reality. These elements give you an idea of how people perceive the world. It also allows you to go deeper in understanding how they really feel. Because here's a deal. Politicians and corporations do not create feelings and desires out of thin air. They do all this work to amplify how we already feel. Even in today's world where we have tremendous access to information, it is very difficult to separate the truth from lies. I hope that by understanding how the propaganda machine works, you will reduce its damage on you. Of course, to a certain degree. You won't be able to prevent morons from being elected, but you can prevent being manipulated by the likes of tobacco, liquor and fast food corporations. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.